Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith, and I'm continuing discussing the paper, What Makes the no Novel Coronavirus So Contagious? You know, why is the R0 so high? And to do that, I had to delve into the structure in the previous video of the uh, coronavirus. Okay, so this structure, this is a 2D image, you know, the protein spikes on the edge. This is a 3D image, uh, artist conception, showing the sphere, the RNA is inside, the, li the lipid is, lipids and proteins are coding, and then these are um, proteins that allow it to bind to cells. And there's a disordered region. The ordered region of protein is like spikes, um, rigid, like uncooked spaghetti. And then there's a wet noodle type part, a disordered region like wet spaghetti and that, you know, throw wet spaghetti against the wall, it sticks. You know, this thing here makes contact with the human cell and binds to these ACE2 receptors. And then the RNA penetrates into the cell and, uh, you know, it infects people. Okay, so I talked a bit, you know, here's a structured protein like spaghetti uncooked in this shape and disordered protein, cooked spaghetti, you know, wet noodles, stuck on the end of the rigid structured protein. And when this, um, this can, allows it to bind to uh, the, the human cell. Okay, and you know, it, there's similarities to how prion diseases can take over and spread in the human body. You know, and they're associated with a lot of um, neurological disorders, even perhaps with, um, Alzheimer's. Possible role for viral infection in Alzheimer's. You get this virus and it attacks the, it builds up a plaque in the brain and you lose uh, neurons. The neurons don't function properly um, and it causes the dementia. Okay, um, so this is a, you know, the prion like domain of the proteins can allow the virus to jump more easily between species with different ACE2 receptors. So, you know, bats to another animal, you know, small mammal to humans. It's because it's got, it's very, very sticky. The stickiness of the virus is huge. Okay, so that, you know, it, it can adapt. It can find other roots inside the cells um, as well. So here's the zombies, the zombie-esque features of prions. So here's the coronavirus. So this is a horrifying image. You've got a person who's, you know, coughing or sneezing and these virus particles, they go and they zonk other people and create zombies. So hor horrifying, you know, little, little cartoon. Okay, so anyway, uh, some of the terms, these prions, it's a type of protein that can trigger normal proteins in the brain to fold abnormally. Okay, so there's similarities to the way the coronavirus is acting, but not on brain cells, but on cells within the human body, for example, in the upper respiratory tract, then down to the lungs, etc. cetera. Um, okay, um, endocytosis is just the way that the RNA material gets into a cell, and then it generates, it replicates new virus particles, and then these, new vi these virus particles can escape the cell and then infect other cells. Um, the sickle cell anemia, this is the sickle or reaping hook, right? So the, re the red blood cells were curved, they're called, you know, sickle, sickle cell anemia, anemia rather, is a condition where you lack, lack enough healthy red blood cells to carry adequate oxygen in your body's tissue. So it makes you tired and weak. Um, Okay, uh, confirmation, it has to do with the, you know, the way um, atoms rotate, you know, in space within the molecule. So the different um, folding of the proteins is very important to their function. Now, I want to talk a little bit about this paper. This is a key paper. It's about indoor transmission of SARS coronavirus 2 okay, of the virus. Now, there's a mechanical engineer guy, there's school of architecture guy, public health guy, energy and environment, a mix of people, 
in China and Hong Kong, China, China. And it talks about a very important study. Basically, the result is that the transmission of the virus is, is inside, whether it be inside buildings, inside planes, inside cruise ships, inside old age homes, inside, and, you know, inside people's houses, you know, it's transmitted, workplaces, etc. You know, it's an indoor disease. You know, the, uh, they studied all, they did a lot of contact tracing of all these people. And the result was that it's all indoors. There were over 8,000 different cases looked at. Only two people, one person caught it from another person outside. You know, I, I've sort of, I'm not surprised that this has come out. Like I mentioned, in 1918, outdoor field hospitals for the pan Spanish flu had 10% mortality rate. In indoor hospitals had 30% rate. So, you know, treating people, having field hospitals outside where the breeze is blowing through is extremely healthy. So, you know, maybe I'll pitch a tent, you know, if it gets really bad. Um, here in Ottawa, I'll probably pitch a tent and, and uh, stay out, you know, sleep. You know, it won't go inside. I'll, I'll, I'll just stay outside. I'll do all my work, all my stuff outside, right? You know, I can do that in the summer, but winter is a bit of a problem. Um, maybe this is a reason why cases in Africa haven't been taken off. You know, if people are living in, you know, if there's great poverty, not a lot of money, people are living in villages, um, you know, the way they want to live, uh, you know, with huts and stuff, you know, poorly constructed buildings that have high ventilation, you know, won't spread as much, right? Maybe that's just the reason. This is key. And, you know, the messages people are getting are stay indoors, stay indoors, stay indoors. The message should be don't go near any people, have that physical separation, you know, but be, be outside for long periods of time. Just don't be near other people. But, you know, even in Canada, people are getting huge fines for doing stuff outside, you know, closing parks and closing beaches, you know, maybe that's the wrong thing to do. Maybe people should be outside as much as possible. Just, you know, just nowhere near anybody, uh, any other person, right? That's, that seems like it could be the safest place to be. So this is a, this is a crucial and key paper. And, you know, it's from, it's, it's, it's Chinese people and it's looking at the uh, spread in China. Um, and they've done tremendous work in, in such a short period of time, you know, so knocking, like I say, this adds on my argument in, in a video, a few videos back about, you know, the idea of creating scapegoats and blaming China, you know, what's the point of that? The characteristics of the virus mean it's going to spread around the world. You know, we need, we need global cooperation. So, uh, basically, um, so what they did is they looked at case reports from municipal health commissions of 320 municipalities in China, not including Hubei province. So the spread in Hubei was huge, but how did it get to other cases? It kind of was overwhelming in Hubei province, but in the rest of China, they had enough resources in that that they send group teams of five people to do contact tracing, huge. I mean, nothing like that's being done, you know, in the US or in Western countries to the extent that it was done in China. So again, China did a, a remarkable job, I think. You know, this was the first country that was hit. If the U.S. had been the first country that was hit, you know, I think things would have been much, much worse today, you know. So, you know, I, like knocking China, I think, is ridiculous. So, you know, look at this paper, you know, bear with me. So they looked at, um, they divided the venues into the, for the outbreaks into homes, transport, food, entertainment, shopping, and miscellaneous. So 53.8% um, of the outbreaks involved three cases, 26.4% were four cases, and only 1.6% were 10 or more cases. So the idea of super spreaders wasn't there. It wasn't in the data. Home outbreaks were the dominant category, um, okay, followed by 79.9% of the transmission was in um, home outbreaks. Transport, 34%, and uh, most home outbreaks were three to five cases. There was only a single outbreak in an outdoor environment, which involved 
two cases. Conclusion. All identified outbreaks of three or more cases occurred in an indoor environment, which confirms that sharing indoor space is a major SARS coronavirus 2 infection risk. Okay, there you have it. Okay, so, you know, they go into the details. Um, and they looked at, you know, like 320 municipalities between January 4th and February 11th, and they looked at the characteristics. So let's have a look at the results, um, basically. Okay, so we'll go down here. Okay, so the six categories, again, were homes, which included apartments and villas, transport, trains, private cars, high-speed rail, bus, passenger plane, taxi, cruise ship, etc., restaurants and other food venues, entertainment venues, gyms, the, the Mahjong game, cards, tea houses and barber shops, and shopping malls, so shopping, shopping venues, shopping malls and supermarkets, and the miscellaneous hotels, hospitals, unspecified community, etc., etc. And they looked at four categories of people based on the relationship, so family members, family relatives, socially connected, so friends, and socially non-connected, strangers. Okay, so they looked at those. Okay, so they, they looked at all of these outbreaks, and, uh, you know, they, the, you know, 318 outbreaks involving 1,245 infected individuals in 120 cities, different cities, but none in, in Hubei. Um, and they looked at the breakdown Okay, so, you know, the different venues. So there were 416 infection venues for 318 outbreaks. 79.9% were in a, a home, one in a villa, all others in apartments. 34% in transport, 14 in restaurant or food venues, 7 at entertainment venues, 7 in shopping malls, 26 miscellaneous. Okay, um, the average number of cases, people, you know, in these outbreaks was 3.7 people for the home outbreaks, 3.8 for transport, 4.9 for food venues, 3.6 for entertainment, 8.7 for shopping, so shopping's bad, 4.4 for miscellaneous. Okay, um, and they looked at the timing. Okay, um, and they got all of the information. So here's some of the, the they got the symptom onset date. Um, where's the, I'll just go and look at some of the key details here. Okay, here, here's one of the key things. Their study does not rule out outdoor transmission of the virus. However, among our 7,324 identified cases in China, with sufficient description. So they knew all of the details about the infection, the timing, the location, etc. Only one outdoor outbreak involved two cases, two people in a village. A 27-year-old man had a conversation outdoors with an individual who returned from Wuhan on 25th of January and had the onset of symptoms on February 1st. So of the 7,324 cases of trend, you know, cases in China, with description on transmission, etc. Only two people, one person caught it from another person outside. So there you have it. Okay, um, and it, you know, basically, it it was an incredible study. You know, you know, and they talk about the the air quality. Okay, so the the worse the air quality is, so here we go. Ventilation rates vary significantly among houses, offices, trains, and buses. So required ventilation rate is 3.9 liters per second in shopping malls, 2.8 liters per second per person in public buses, but 8 to 10 is required for good indoor air quality. 25 liters per second indoor is needed. I mean, the problem is many existing buildings are crowded, poorly ventilated, and unhygienic. CO2 levels can be as high, high as 3,500 parts per million within the buildings. Um, and they're virus, uh, they're like petri dishes, dishes for virus spread. So this is a key paper, Outside Rules. Thanks for listening.